Welcome back to Global Environmental Crime Watch. I'm your host, Bill Paul. How can a civil servant amass a personal fortune of $15 billion? Easy. Just destroy the very rainforest you have been entrusted to protect. That's the charge being leveled against this man. His name is Abdul Taib bin Mahmoud. Taib is the chief minister of Sarar, the largest of Malaysia's 13 states and one of two states located on the rainforest-rich island of Borneo. According to the Bruno Manzer Fund, a Zurich-based nonprofit that campaigns against illegal logging, Taib has made corruption an art form using his position to line his own pockets, destroying Borneo's rainforest in the process. As illustrated by these scenes from a 2011 protest in London, Taib has long been in the crosshairs of environmental activists. Few global leaders, however, have spoken out against this man. One who has is former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown. He called the destruction of Sararik's rainforest probably the biggest environmental crime of our times. Malaysia's once vast pristine jungle has been stripped bare, and enormous areas have been planted with palm oil, in an environmental nightmare that shows no sign of slowing. Ah yes, palm oil. The root of so much environmental evil in this world. Used for cooking, in cosmetics, and to make biofuel, global demand for palm oil is surging, and international conglomerates are going hat in hand to questionable politicians like Taib, who, for the right price, apparently will strip a country bare, knocking down the home of endangered species and indigenous people in order to build sterile palm oil plantations that thrive in a tropical climate. As this YouTube-posted Australian news report shows, from the safety of its London studio, Radio Free Sararik, whose principles include Gordon Brown's sister-in-law, bashes Taib regularly. I would describe as him as a dictator in, in all but name. He utterly controls Sarawak. He and his family own anything that's worth owning in Sarawak. They first brought everything into government monopoly and then privatized it into their own possession. But if Taib is worried about international condemnation, you'd never know it. Befitting a man who clearly seems unafraid of the long arm of the law, Taib put his official denial for all the world to see. The truth is that uh, we in Sarawak are committed to practice sustainable uh, uh, management of our forest. In our traditional uh, forest, we practice what is called uh, fill-in, uh, fill-in planting, uh, where there is a bald area as a result of uh, this eight trees that come up from uh, that been uh, harvested from per hectare. We, if there is still not enough tree, we plant trees in it, and then. Uh, on top of that, we want to make sure that the timber industry will not be uh, touching the traditional trees uh, by illegal logging. So we have converted the, uh, some areas to be, uh, to be planted with quick-growing species, which will make the timber industries to be still uh, expanding, but uh, adding on to the greenness of our forest. Uh, we expect that uh, one million hectares can be planted within the next 10 years. I have the greatest respect for the people of Britain or anywhere else in the world who care about the issue of deforestation, as I myself do. And because of that, therefore, I'm willing to open up the country for independent international inspection, they will see that we still have much more forests than people give us credit for to be preserved for the next generations. People can make many claims, but my government has been 
very deeply committed to sustainable management of our forest. The truth is, we have nothing to hide. Nothing to hide? Really? In a moment, we'll get a second opinion from Dr. Lucas Strauman, director of the Bruno Manzer Fund, the Global Environmental Crime Watch. All right, so let's cut through the official stuff and get right down to finding out exactly how a civil servant could amass a $15 billion personal fortune. To help us navigate through all this, let's welcome in Dr. Lucas Strauman, director of the Bruno Manzer Fund in Switzerland. Dr. Lucas Strauman from Zurich, thank you for joining us today on behalf of the Bruno Manzer Fund. How did this gentleman amass such a fortune as a civil servant? Yes, you're absolutely right. He's, he's been a civil servant. He's been a cabinet minister, in fact, for five decades. You, you wouldn't believe it. He started off in 1963 when Sarawak became part of Malaysia uh, during independence uh, after being a British colony. He was a cabinet minister at the age of 27, and he still is a cabinet minister and chief of government at the age of 77, which he shouldn't be. And he abused his political power in a spectacular way, uh, cutting down the Borneo rainforest in the state of Sarawak for three decades. So imagine it's a, it's a state the size of England. So it's the largest state of Malaysia. Uh, it's been all covered with virgin jungle. The jungle has been cut down. It's all secondary forest uh, now, more or less, maybe 5% uh, primary forest left. And now all this land is being uh, uh, conversed into oil palm plantations. So it's an ongoing destruction in several stages. And corruption is one of the primary incentives for, for Taib to do all that, because he is personally enriching himself and his family. He says that 70% of the rainforest is intact. You say 90% of the rainforest has been destroyed. How do you know that 90% has been destroyed? Well, it's very easy to prove. I mean, you go on Google Earth and you, you will see what the Sarawak rainforest is like. I mean, these times are over when uh, a head of state just could say, well, everything is fine in, in my state. Now we can check ourselves. Uh, it's important to say that not 90% of the forest is gone. I mean, it's 90% of the primary forest, the virgin jungle that has been logged at least once, maybe twice or three times. Uh, but definitely, it's only a very small area of primary jungle left, but the secondary forests are getting more and more important because there is a lot of biodiversity in the secondary forests as well, and we need to keep them and we need to prevent those forests from being converted into oil palm plantations, which are a monoculture, as you know. What are the specific laws that this gentleman and his family are breaking, both the Malaysian laws and the international laws? Well, they, he breaks all the laws, all corruption laws, all anti-corruption laws that exist in Malaysia. And the problem is that because uh, the government in Kuala Lumpur needs him uh, to stay in power. I mean, he needs, they need him to bring the votes for, for, the, for the government to stay in power. So, so they won't touch him. And the judiciary is not independent. So we know... Uh, for more than one year, an investigation has been going on by the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, which was triggered by uh, our campaign, by the way. But this investigation is leading nowhere because the Attorney General and the Prime Minister and the Minister of Justice, they have no interest whatsoever that this will go forward. And they say no, and it will stop there. What about international laws? What about the involvement of Interpol and similar organizations? Well, in, in, interestingly, corruption um, and money laundering are uh, crimes that p can be prosecuted internationally. And that is for us a very interesting and important angle. Uh, now, we have launched a criminal complaint in Switzerland uh, against UBS, a Swiss bank that is heavily involved in Malaysia, because they laundered what we think up to 90 million US dollars for Musa Aman, he is the head of state in neighboring Sabah, so the second Malaysian state on Borneo. And if we could find out or get hold of evidence 
on the bank connections of Taib Mahmoud, we could try the same either in Switzerland, which is our home turf, obviously, or in any other country. I think what you're saying is he controls the process from A to Z. You don't cut down a log. You don't export a log. You don't uh, use a log abroad without his or his family's involvement in some way. Is that right? Absolutely. He's missed the 10% or maybe missed the 15%. And you have to pay him off from the very first stage of obtaining a logging concession uh, or cutting down, shipping uh, the timber to the port, and then even exporting the timber on ships. Um, you have to pay him off. There is an investigation underway in Australia. How far has that gone? Uh, and do you have hope for uh, something happening there? We have approached the Australian government as we have approached the German government, the British and the Canadian government and the US government. And unfortunately, these governments are, I mean, they are very interesting to get the information. But as long as Malaysia is not doing anything, uh, no other country would really do much. And they say, look, these people are in power. We know they are corrupt. We can't do anything about it. So, uh, well, we wait until they fall and then we will go after them. But that is a very unsatisfactory uh, standpoint to us. I mean, and I don't think it's a very legal standpoint either. All right, Dr. Straubman, thank you very much. I appreciate your time and especially your information. Okay, thanks a lot, Bill. According to Reuters, UBS said it was cooperating with the investigation. Quote, UBS complies with the rules and regulations in all the markets where it operates. Unquote. A spokesman told Reuters. In a letter to the Bruno Manzer Fund, Interpol's General Secretariat stated, quote, Interpol's assistance may be activated only by the decision of the competent domestic authorities, and at the request of the National Contact Point, National Central Bureau, NCB. Should you wish to trigger criminal proceedings against the individuals at stake, you are kindly advised to contact the National Police and or Judiciary. Unquote. 